Welcome back, everyone. In this uh, segment, we're going to be talking about publishing and uh, specifically about book and magazine publishing. And I have with me a uh, colleague, uh, Frank Romano, who is the Melbert B. Carey Distinguished Professor of uh, Graphic Arts. You left out the junior. Melbert B. Carey Jr., Distinguished Professor of Graphic Arts at RIT. Uh, this is a, uh, the, I think this is the longest uh, formal name for a professorship at RIT, and, and uh, Frank feels that that uh, distinguishes him among the distinguished professors. Um, and I'm hap very happy to have you here. Uh, you've uh, had a long career in the publishing business and, and written many books and uh, published uh, magazines, and uh, so we, we're, we're here to talk to you about the, the business of publishing and and how the publishers interact with, with the printers. And let's uh, begin with a little bit of a history here. How did you get into the business? I started as a marketing assistant at the old Mergenthal Linotype Company, uh, which is the company that made Linotype machines, and worked for CompuGraphic and Marketing Communications. And then on my 30th birthday, I left and said, um, I'm going to become famous. And that was a little hard to do, by the way, because no one had ever heard of me. So I decided that the only way to become famous was to publish a book. So I went out and, and using every trick I could, I got a book produced for nothing, literally, uh, and wound up with 500 of them, and I gave them away. And with that was a press release that said, Frank Romano, noted author. Uh -huh. And that's how it all started. And several years later, came up with the idea of starting a publication called Type World, which covered all the things that were happening in typesetting and now pre-press, and um, put every issue together uh, twice a month for 18 years, and then sold it off for several million dollars to a larger publishing company. And so if you want to make money in publishing, uh, sell your magazine. So I hear that when you came to RIT, you actually endowed the chair yourself, or is that a, is that a myth? <laughs> the, the, the part, part. We give away a lot. <laughs> uh, Making the, it was fun. Giving, uh, giving it away is even more fun. Right. Now, normally in publishing, uh, the, the, the idea is you have an idea, idea a concept. And, what the, and, and the concept, in order for it to, to really take off, should be something that doesn't exist or where there's, there's, it hasn't been done before. No, it can be. It could, could be done before. The, really, the secret to publishing has to do with two things, and only two, and that is the list and the base of advertisers. That's the only thing that matters. Okay. Um, is the list that you can get of some definable audience, one that advertisers would want to reach in order to promote a product to. So that's why most magazines fail, is that base is either not definable okay. or there are not enough advertisers in that marketing segment. All right. uh, so the first thing is to create a list. And I was lucky in that I had a whole uh, group of newsletters at that time for all the different photo typesetting machines. I had one called Vippy for the old Mercantile VIP, and I had one called Eddie for the edit writer, and one called Compi for the, <laughs> there's a whole series here. And uh, the last one was the direct input photo typesetters, which I called Dippy. Uh -huh. And uh, so I wound up with all these newsletters and all these lists, and I merged them all together, which was not an easy task in those days, by the way, because you didn't have the programs you have today, so you had to do it on a dressograph plates or whatever. Um, and so once I had that um, and could define my, my uh, advertising base, then the magazine took form. The content was the easiest job. If you only get into it because you're an editor, forget it. That's not the reason. You could have the greatest content and, and fail. The only way to make money is because you can sell advertising. That's what supports it. 50% of a magazine is, is advertising pages. That, that, that's who pays the bills. Very few magazines in the United States are paid for, uh, subscription-based. They mm -hmm. are free circulation. And what you do is you send it out free to an audience. And you've all done this, by the way. Everybody who's uh, watching this, you've all filled out these, uh, uh, reader service, uh, these coupons in there. This is a reader service coupon. But in some cases, they are also a free subscription coupon. Now, here's the secret. I don't want anybody to reveal this. If you want to get any magazine for nothing, always check or make sure you check off a box that's there. Don't, don't ever check off other. That will kick it off the system. And always indicate that you're the CEO. And that if they ask you what equipment you have, always indicate that you have more than 10 of whatever it is. And I guarantee that you will get that publication for nothing. Because once they can define you, they can go to the advertiser and say, look, we reach all the CEOs or most of the CEOs in a particular marketplace, and that's what sells advertising. Now, I, I've, I've, I'm uh, guilty of filling out many of those. All of my subscriptions are, uh, are on the basis of, of uh, 
claims that I've made that I buy more than a million dollars worth of equipment a year and things like that. What you're telling me is that if a lot of people do that, those lists are uh, suspect. Of course, but that's the game. Fortunately, enough people out, out there are honest and it makes no difference. But some of us want to get these magazines and not have to pay for them. Whatever the cost. And, uh, and by the way, they want to have as many names in the list as possible, so they really don't, can't cross-check in any way, shape, or form because the larger the circulation base, and your advertising rates are based on that, so the larger the advertising base, the higher the rates, and therefore the more you, you make in terms of profit. By the way, very profitable business. One of the reasons I got into publishing was I said, how can I make money without doing anything? And uh, well, magazines, you do a little bit more than books. You do a book, and it makes money for you for a long period of time after that. Magazines you have to keep doing over and over. But once you build an intellectual property base in the magazine business, you're building a content base and, and uh, and, and a list that you can uh, re recirculate. For instance, one of the magazines I started, Computer Artist, uh, we merged into electronic publishing. Um, and that mailing list is still selling like crazy. Color Publishing was merged in three years ago. Doesn't exist as a magazine. But we're still selling that list at a very high rate. So we're making more money now off the lists than we're making off some of the publication stuff. If we go back to, the, to this list that you merged from these different newsletters you had, that initial list that you started with, how did you present, uh, how do you present the list to the potential advertiser? What are they looking at? Let's say you have 10,000 or 20,000 uh, people in your list. Uh, how do they determine whether th those are the people they want to reach? Do they do it person by person? No, they really don't. What, what it really comes down to is the way you present the data. So you normally do a promotion piece of some sort that says 80% um, of all of our readers are CEOs and, and 50% of them all have uh, this machine and another 40% have this machine. And you then go to the companies or the advertising agencies. Sometimes you go direct to the company, sometimes to the agency, and sometimes both. And essentially, you present the information by saying, here's a market because you make scanners. Uh, we reach all the people who have computers, and you hook up scanners to computers. And most of the people there are art and design people, so therefore, your scanners would be things that they would buy. So by promoting them in our magazine, you now are reaching a very specialized audience. And there's no waste circulation. So if you advertised in a, a business magazine, you'd reach a lot of accountants who don't buy scanners. But if you go to ours, we have creative people, and they do. So you present it by saying, here are the people, the products, the companies uh, that can buy your product and why. So when you, when you make this presentation, you're making it to the, the, uh, the company that's doing the advertising. Where does, if a company is having the ad made by an agency, where does the, how does the agency work into the... The agency, by the way, is part of the problem sometimes because they're dealing with so many magazines it's kind of hard to deal with. So, and they, they may create a generic ad and try to run it in every publication on earth. Uh, but in any case, the way it normally works is the, the client uh, helps, gets an ad produced, w working with their agency or with their in-house organization or whatever. And the ad is produced and it goes through the agency to a color separation company, color separator. This is what most color separators do, by the way. They then make a master of that uh, ad, and they then make film. Now, every magazine is slightly different mm -hmm. in the way it takes film. I, I need a 133-line uh, screen. I need a 120-line screen, whatever that is. I need emulsion down. I need emulsion up. Uh, I need a certain density. So we're all a little bit different in that regard. So our specs are published. So the color separator now knows what the specs are, and they then produce film that is for me, four mm -hmm. pieces of film and a proof. They come to me, to the magazine publisher, uh, with an insertion order. Now, you knew that was coming in advance because at the beginning of the year or some other time, they sent you an, a contract that said, you're going to get six ads from us over the next 12 months, and they're going to be in the following issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, on all of them, we want to have a reader service number, and we want you to strip in the following thing. Mm -hmm. And so we're prepared. We lay out our magazine knowing that that ad is going to be on uh, page uh, three or whatever it may be. Uh, we, we send the film. Uh, to the printer, and they strip it into the flat, and it gets printed, and everybody's happy. Now, when it's done, they take it apart, they send us the film back, and we reuse that if it's going to be reprinted, reprinted in another issue. Mm -hmm. So the color separator takes care of all the mechanical aspects, the agency takes care of all the contract mm -hmm. aspects. Then you send the invoice to the ad agency, they get a 15% discount for placing the ad, mm -hmm. and um, Usually, most of us offer a 2% uh, 30 days. You never get paid in 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you get paid within 60 or 45 days or something like that. And uh, so that's how the publishing business works. 
insertion or, uh, contracts, insertion orders, film. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is that in the new age, as we go computer to plate, there is no film anymore. Mm -hmm. So having the color separator send me four pieces of film now is a problem. What's happened is most printers have had to buy copy dot scanners in order to scan that film to get, get it onto the page. Into digital form. Uh, what we really want to do is electronic advertising, which is happening right now in both TIFFIT form and in PDF. And they're fighting for the soul of the uh, digital advertising world right now. Where, where, where would you put your money? Or you're, you're not? I'd say PDF. On PDF. The nice thing about PDF is that if, I, if the printer changes presses, they can modify some of the information. With TIFFIT, it is specific to a press or output device. It'd be very hard to re re repurpose that. So the, the, you just start with a list. You have, uh, you have therefore, uh, this publication. You, you, you work up a rate sheet uh, for, for what, it, what it would cost to have an ad of a certain size there. Uh, you're, you're probably, what, what you also said is you're probably going to work with uh, advertisers and sell them a, a year's worth of, of, of placements in there uh, in, in most cases? Usually it's a contract and they contract because the rate is based on the frequency. So if they go into the publication six times it's more expensive per ad than if they go in 12 times. And so those discount schedules are published and so they contract. So you know usually a year in advance the bulk of your advertising. Mm -hmm. You know that each issue is going to be profitable because you have a certain base of ads that will be there. And then from issue to issue, you have certain people who come in at the last minute because there's some trade show and they decided to be in there, or someone who runs a small display ad because of some uh, discount they're giving or whatever it may be. And that really becomes gravy. If you can sell the contracts, that's where you, you, you have your base, and then everything after that is pure profit. Mm -hmm. Now, w we talked to uh, Owen Smith uh, about the newspaper industry, and he uh, told us that the, uh, the, the percentage of advertising from one paper to another will vary. Uh, many papers are like a 60-40. They'll have 60% advertising, 40% editorial. Uh, some papers will go as high as 75% advertising and 25% editorial. Uh, in this type of, ma in, in magazine publishing, uh, is, it, is, is, is there that kind of variability from one title to the next? Oh, of course. It depends on how much advertising you're selling. Now, there are certain rules. The first rule is that most, the, most of the magazines that, that you get are free circulation. They come under the controlled circulation rate at the Postal Service. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a wonderful rate, by the way. Somewhere at the, in the beginning of the Republic, someone decided that the dissemination of information should be supported. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, any dissemination of, of magazines and books, by the way, but mostly magazines, um, uh, get delivered at almost the speed of first class at a greatly reduced rate called second class or controlled circulation. To be in that category, one, you have to prove that over 50% of the people who get it want it. Mm -hmm. So that means you get that card every, every year that says yes. You, have to you know it says yes and no, and you always say, why does it say no? Whoever checks no? No one does, but the Postal Service says that they have to have a choice. All right, when you say yes, that the, all those forms are saved, and once a year the Postal Service audits you and comes in and says, all right, show me, show us that you have that, that circulation. All right, the other rule is that you cannot have more than 75% advertising. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not a magazine anymore. It's a catalog and comes under a whole different rate structure. Uh, the other rule is that you cannot have the advertising to, to specifically help one company. So then, because then it becomes one company's promotion, promotion piece and it's yeah, not, right. a, not a publication. So if you follow those rules, you're okay. Now, if you could get 75% advertising, it'd be wonderful, but your readers would hate you mm -hmm. because they want to read editorial. So mm -hmm. most of us aim for a 50-50. And so the number of pages in the magazine is always based on the number of ads. Mm -hmm. So when you look on the back, and that's the first thing I ever do when I open up a magazine, is to see 72 pages. That means that half those are ad pages. Because that's how you lay your magazine out. Um, you know, the New York Times has the uh, statement, all the news that's fit to print. Well, in magazines, it's all the news that fits, and that's based upon the number of ads. So if I know that I'm going to have 26 ads, it'll be a 52-page issue. You mentioned the, the postal service and the postal regulations, and it reminds me of, uh, you know, the reason why this, the, this country started was, was over the, something called the Stamp Act. It was one of the, 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 the outrages, and, and I think uh, the, the people who founded the country were interested in, in uh, because that was intended to, to put a price or a tax on the price of paper, and, and they thought that that was a, 
something they didn't want to do anymore. Um, what's happened with post with a postal? We hear a lot about postal rates and 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 how you know a one percent increase in postal rates has a dramatic impact. Uh, and uh, what's the tr trend been there over the years? A one percent increase in postal rates uh, translates into almost a ten percent change to your bottom line. And so, because postage, one, the post office does not take credit. You must pay them at the time you deliver the publication to them to be mailed. Uh, so th your cash flow had better be pretty good because you, they get paid up front no matter what. Um, yes, that's a very serious concern, by the way, which is why magazines over the last few years have gone to lighter and lighter weight papers. Mm -hmm. uh, number, number five grade offset is a very important grade because that's the best they've been able to do up to now and still be able to get it to a printing press. If they could, we could run tissue paper, it would be even better. Um, then a lot of us have gone to uh, saddle stitching instead of a perfect binding if we possibly can because that cuts down weight as well. Same with covers because weight is part of it. Now the way you pay, by the way, is uh, you have to fill out this very complex form that has to do with the weight and the distance. In other words, what zone everything is going to. And so it's a, it's a, a sliding scale. But uh, it, it does get rather pricey. One third of all your cost is in postage. One third of your cost. Yeah. So the so the other the other part of it is obviously having the thing printed. That's the easy part. That's the easy part. You give it to a printer and they print it. That's the right. nice thing about working with printers, by the way. The uh, the the length of the contracts there though is uh, I, uh, uh, Sherry uh, Kasunich said that uh, the typical gravure contract uh, runs anywhere from seven to fifteen years for publication work. Um, what, what about other types of, of, of magazine publishing? Uh, what's the shortest kind of contract you might sign with a printer? I never had a contract. Everything was done on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, everyone's a little bit different in that regard. If you give them a contract uh, and commit to a certain period of time, you normally can get a discount of some sort. You lose a little flexibility of being able to move. But most people, once you stay with a printer, you, you're with the printer. Mm -hmm. um, but you still want a little bit of flexibility in there. Now, the reason the contracts really exist has to do with paper. And that is the people who are on the contract always have first dibs on the paper that's available. Mm -hmm. Now, a few years ago, if you will recall, there was a very serious problem with paper. Um, in the United States, we had sold most of our pulp because the printing industry was down, so we sold our pulp overseas. When the print industry, industry came back up, uh, there was no pulp to make paper, so there was a shortage of paper. So those companies that were under contract because the, the, there were allocations on the paper had first dibs on that paper. And anyone who was not under contract had to take whatever was available. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason you have a contract, is to protect yourself in terms of paper prices if possible. Usually it, you negotiate certain increases based upon uh, the price of the pulp or whatever. Um, but in our case, we were never big enough to really worry about that. Now, Gravure, the magazines that are produced in Gravure, the top 34 magazines, are produced with Gravure because they have runs over a million. Um, but after that, you see less and less Gravure, and 90% and of the magazines are done with Offset, and their runs are increasing uh, every day. So the Gravure industry doesn't seem to be seeing a lot of growth in the magazine marketplace, and most of their titles, by the way, are, are consumer-oriented titles more mm -hmm. than anything else. But there are thousands of titles of uh, magazines in the United States. I think there are 23 titles in the chicken industry. Mm -hmm. 23 chicken titles. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, a typical publisher today of this, this, uh, this magazine, Electronic Publishing, uh, those files are made on uh, computers and using uh, uh, probably Quark Express. Quark Express. Uh, in fact, we started. We were the first ones to do publication on Quark. I had written the first book on Quark Express. And I was dying for a way to, uh, to get out of having to paste the magazine up. It was just, that was the only part that was still mechanical. And so uh, by using Quark, I, and I really pushed very hard to uh, get uh, uh, Apple to put Palatino and Century Schoolbook into the list of fonts, because that's what I was using. Mm -hmm. And that worked out pretty well. Um, and then when Verityper came out with the uh, 600 uh, DPI wide machine, 1117, because we were tabloid then, um, we, everything was in place, so we used Quark Express, put the entire publication together, and just left holes for the ads. And uh, that was the, the, the best thing we ever did. And then when I sold it, I then converted most of the other magazines over. So most magazines in the United States today are, are done with Quark Express. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you, and, and by the way, that moved some of the production to the editorial department away from the production department. Mm -hmm. it used to be that you typed out a manuscript, you gave it to the production department, they set it in type, and two days later you got it back, you dummied it up, 
and then you gave it back to them and they assembled it and made a copy and then you found something wrong and you had to go through this long process to make a correction now you do it right on the screen you make your corrections there i send in my articles by email now so they just take it put it right into quark fix it uh, make it fit into the space that's available and it goes off to production and production then gets the film made uh, and has the ads inserted now i i uh, know that um, when i worked in the in the newspaper business um, we, uh, I, did, I worked on a weekly newspaper, and, and all of the images were, we'd, we'd put black boxes in there, uh, and, and then the, the, the imaging or, or the, the scanning or the camera work or whatever was done by either the printing company or a color separation house. What's the trend there? Are publishers uh, doing more of, the, of that type of, of work? Are they doing color scanning? or No, not at all. The, the, by the way, that, the, what you described as the window is the way it had always been done. Many newspapers, by the way, made a Velox, which was a, a print with a half-tone picture mm -hmm. on it, and they pasted that, so it only had to be one camera shot right. instead of multiple shots and stripping. Uh, the, the, what we do and what almost every magazine does now is OPI, and that is the, we send the images to the, to the pre-press. We use a pre-press service. Uh, some people use the printer. And they then scan them at high res, keep the high res images, and give us back low-res image and you can fit hundreds of low-res images on a floppy sometimes they come over email and they are then used to uh, put into position to define where all of the uh, the images go they're low-res but you can see them you can crop them you can enlarge them a little bit or to, to reduce them a little bit uh, and then when the file goes back to the service uh, they replace the low-res file with the high-res file and everything comes out the way you want so your advantage is you actually see on the screen you can print it out uh, the image that's going to be there. So you make sure that the, the article you're writing has the picture of the product that it's describing. Right. So it's not, or it's not upside down or whatever, right. which we've done in the past. So the picture gets flopped, and so the nameplate comes out backwards. So this helps you to, to solve all of that and cuts down the size of the file. If you were to do the scanning, you could imagine then the size of the files that would have to go over to the printer. Right. What about the transmission of the files? How, how is that normally done today for a magazine like this? Is it on disk? Uh, is it, uh, is it over uh, telephone lines or? It's a wonderful system called Messenger. Messenger. And what happens is that twice a day, they come by in a little, little uh, van or white truck, uh, has a little magnetic sign on the side from the pre-press service of the printer, and they pick up everything. And usually you give them discs, you give them a proof, uh, you might give them the film because they also need the film to strip up for the ads that are coming in. And they take all of that back, put it all together, print it out, make a proof of it, and that when that messenger comes back again, they deliver proofs to you. The proofs then go through the editorial department, they will go through the production department, the publisher will probably review them, just to make sure that the pages look okay, there are no anomalies, that you don't have an article about company A and their major competitor's ad is right opposite them, so you have to look for that kind of stuff. You look for legal things to make sure you haven't done anything that's gonna create a problem. So the proof is a very important part of this. You make a few changes if necessary, all of that, the messenger picks it up again and takes it back and it's all taken care of. Now, that's the way it was and is if you're in the same place where your printer or prepress service is. Mm -hmm. That works out great. If you're not, then you're going to be sending it in a FedEx package to someone some distance away. The tent trend today is to get away from that and to send that over the internet mm -hmm. um, or use any of the proprietary services like WhamNet um, or some of the others that are out there. High right speed, now. a high speed uh, digital Right. service like that. Um, if, I, if I'm an advertiser, I bought a, an advertisement in this magazine, a two-page spread, let's say. Uh, this, this whole thing goes to the printer. Everything arrives there. They, they do all of that. Uh, who's going to okay the, 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 the job as it's running? Is, does anybody do that now? Do, no, the printer takes responsibility for that. Normally, the way it works is we see color proofs as they do them. So we see a page proof in full color with everything on it. Um, they're called scatter proofs. After the printer gets it, um, they pull another proof, which is the blueprint from the film, and they send that back. And that is the final checking copy. That's the one we have to sign off on. And that essentially says every ad is where it's supposed to be. All the folios line up. Um, it's not in color because we've already approved the color. And, and because it's on film, it didn't change. Right. So we don't have to worry about that. So the blueprint, the ads are there. And so we're able to see every page, the way it's going to lay out, and we sign off, and that copy has to go back to them, by the way. They must have for their files a signed copy that says, you approve this, because uh, if something goes wrong legally, someone has to know where it, where it happened. Then it gets run. 
Normally, they have their own quality control people, and they make sure that everything is run to your quality. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to admit, there are times when you want to go on a, uh, a press, uh, a proofing trip, and Quad Graphics has this wonderful facility in Albany, just north of Albany, and they own this inn. It's a Victorian inn, and the art directors from New York love going up there to approve the printing. Ah, I don't think it's necessary, but it sounds it. like a nice trip. Yeah. Um, so, so if we start with a mailing list, we, we know who this is going to go to. We've got everything together. It all goes to the printer. We've, we've taken care of that. The, 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 the product is running. How does the, how does the, the product then uh, connect up with that list? How, how is it then distributed? Almost every printer that's in the magazine business has a printing, uh, a mailing facility in the building. Um, the biggest one, the one that we use is Publishers Press down in Florence, Kentucky. And uh, they, they have to be one of the, uh, Quad, I guess, would be number one, or maybe Donnelly is up there, too. But the Publishers Press actually has a postal facility there with postal workers who work there. And so they come off the... They're government workers, U.S. Exactly government right. postal workers. And so it comes off the press, goes to the bindery line, saddle stitch, trimmed. At that point, they put uh, uh, mailing labels on. We've sent them the list on mag tape in advance. They've put it into their computer system, printed the Cheshire labels out, put them on, they have their own systems for bundling them into bags by zones, which is what the Postal Service wants. Postal Service accepts them there. They go into a U.S. Postal Service truck and go to a mailing facility, um, a, a bulk mailing facility, so they can be distributed even faster. So they don't go through the local post office mm -hmm. uh, at all. Now, the new trend is not to have a mailing label anymore. The new trend is to have a big white rectangle, rectangular box on the front page, which art directors hate, by the mm -hmm. way. Um, and to inkjet the uh, address on there. And so probably by next year, all magazines will be done that way. Right now, the bigger magazines are done that way. And the inkjet uh, labeling is done as the magazine's being printed or after the magazine is um, printed? Uh, just after it's bound. After the, the final step on the bindery line, it goes right into the, uh, the addressing system. So, the, so the, whole com the whole thing is computer controlled. The inkjet labels will go on. These things will be in, in, sorted already, and, and, and then they're bundled. Um, and, and the publisher really doesn't have to even think about mailing at this point. It's, it's a service that's taken care well, of. When we first started, um, because we were dealing with uh, some newspapers who didn't have mailing facilities, we had to then truck the issue to a mailing house to mail it out. And that step was really uh, uh, the thing that killed us in terms of getting it out. After that, we only dealt with printers who had uh, mailing facilities and so everything was taken care of and so and by the way the, po the, the, the bundling it for the postal service is not an easy task mm -hmm. uh, having owned a smaller magazine that only had a circulation of about 10,000 I actually did them in my basement with my kids for a while that was a terrible idea but the way it works is you have to have uh, in a bag you have to have a certain zone and then in the bag, all those of a certain zip code up to three digits have to be, have Rubber string band, around yeah, them. Yeah, string, string. And, and, and so, you know, my oldest son knew all the rules yeah. after a while on yeah. how to do that. Uh, so I learned a lot about how to do it. So I don't ever want to worry about that. So no publisher really worries about that mechanical aspect of it. So just to summarize here, uh, the magazine business is, uh, is, is a matter of getting a list, uh, then selling that list to advertisers, uh, getting your advertising to a point where it's it's where the that is going to be uh, 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 that is going to deliver a profit after you take off off the cost of printing and production and, and mailing and everything and, and that's the business. It's and actually it's a little better than that by the way because what's happened is if you own one magazine, you should really own three or four. So when I had our first magazine Typo, I bought another one. And I started another one because if you're going to own one, the infrastructure to support that one, people to answer the telephone, people to send out invoices, people to look at accounts payable and receivable, uh, sometimes the editorial staff can be shared, production is shared, um, all of the things that support the business aspects can be shared. And now if you're a gigantic magazine, then that's fine, but if you're multiple magazines and they're smaller, you can share that. Mm -hmm. And so. Printing and mailing are your two biggest expenses. After that, it's your uh, content, your editorial staff, your professional people. They make a big difference in terms of what you turn out. And so uh, that, that's your cost. Now, the cost is really unimportant to an extent mm -hmm. if you can sell enough advertising. Right. That's the key. 25% of the people on the Forbes 400 wealthiest people 
got their wealth because of publishing. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very nice business. You buy paper uh, for 50 cents a pound and you sell it for like $100 a pound. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, you can make your money. Now, you've got to sell the advertising. So if you don't have a list that's good enough, uh, you don't have a rationale, that is, people can't understand what you're all about, then you're not going to sell a lot of ads. You sell the ads and you start to make the money. And uh, what you discover then is you only need a handful of ads in order to uh, break even, and then everything after that is gravy. And what I did was I made the publication so that the, um, the part of the publication that was the uh, classified section really carried, this was, all the cost was covered by these little ads. And after that, anything I got on display was, was really wonderful. And I so see. it becomes a very, very profitable business. So all of you want to start a magazine, by the way, get a list, have a good idea, and find the advertisers. Well, that's, that's a, a model. We saw the, 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 the newspaper model, and, and now the magazine model. Th these are ad-driven uh, models. Uh, but there are other types of publishing, and uh, the two that you've been involved with uh, that are, do not contain advertising are newsletter publishing and book publishing. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we should turn our attention to, uh, to that uh, different, it's a different world, really, and uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you want to talk a little bit about news, newsletters? Yeah, well, uh, let me stay with them just one second and show the link here. Uh, when you own a publication, you have what is known as a franchise. That franchise means that you're reaching an audience on a regular basis, whether it's twice a month or, or monthly or whatever. Once we did that and we were making very nice profits, the question, what, could we, what else could we do? So we started a newsletter. The newsletter had information that we wouldn't put in the publication. It was, it was information that mentioned specific companies by name and said things about them that were not always complimentary. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't do that if you want to sell advertising, because mm -hmm. this is where you want to be friends with everybody. So most magazines tend to be rather neutral in that regard. Newsletter business is a very nice business. There's no advertising to worry about. It's all subscriber driven. Uh, the paper is, is meaningless. The postage is meaningless because people are paying for the value of the information in that newsletter. So for four pages, you can get $195 a year mm -hmm. because you're going to give them something they can't get any other way. And that is personal opinion, which is what companies will pay for. Now, these would be larger companies. I'll give you another example. The company that bought our magazine, Penwell Publishing, very large publisher, they, they published the Oil and Gas Journal, which is a gigantic publication. They subscribed to a specialized newsletter for the publishing industry. And when uh, two gigantic publishing companies, Reed Holdings and Elsevier, merged, uh, this newsletter came by fax that the, the day that the word got out. Now, whenever two large publishing companies merge, normally there are magazines in, that compete, and usually they're going to get rid of one. Mm -hmm. And so they immediately analyzed all the magazines and found there were two or three magazines that would make a very nice fit with magazines that, that Penwell had. And so they were immediately able to put together a plan and bid on those magazines before most other people had seen the release in some publication. I see. So the immediacy of the newsletter, the content and the opinion of the newsletter are something that people will pay a premium for. So, and, and the nice thing then is you promote the newsletter through the publication. Right. Now, when you say immediacy, that tends to lead to, uh, to forms other than print. It seems to me that if I'm really desperate for that information, um, I, for example, I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal online and I get bulletins from them electronically. Is the same thing happening in the newsletter industry? Are, are newsletters going electronic? Exactly right. Uh, this morning, uh, I turned on my machine and the Siebold report uh, the bulletin was there, comes uh, uh, every week, or if there's something special, had information in it that won't appear in the newsletter until another two weeks hence. Um, in some cases, we fax out information because then it, the immediacy is there with, with fax. And a lot of newsletters are now going on to the web. Uh, so you have a site with a password, and you go on it, and all the information is there. And by the way, I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, and I just love that service where they will announce certain things. And you know what to go look for. Right. So, uh, newslet what you're saying is if you start with a, uh, with a magazine, it's, it's, it, it's a natural extension to go into the newsletter business. You want to keep those separate, though. You, you, you don't want people to associate what you say in the newsletter with, with a magazine. And you have to have two different editors. You really can't have the same person doing both. Uh, the, the, the name definitely would be different. Uh, yes, the newsletter has to have its own identity, its own point of view. 
um, and has to be perceived that way by the marketplace. Um, and, and it usually works, by the way. Uh, most, most people who are in the magazine business also have newsletters in one form or another. And, uh, of course, the newsletters that make the most money are the ones that recommend stocks. And, of mm -hmm. course, they're thousands of dollars a year. Yeah. And, of course, the guy who publishes it probably is also in a, has a position in that stock. But, hey, what do I know? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, let's turn our attention to the, this other form of publishing called book publishing. And we've got some of your books here. Uh, how did you, I, I know the first book you did, you printed yourself. What was the name of that book? It was, uh, actually, I didn't print it myself. It was called The Handbook of Composition Input. And uh, in, uh, in 1972, there was nothing that covered all the things that were happening with keyboards and OCR. I Boy, see, that was I new see. then. I, th I remember that book. Paper tape. Um, what I did was I, I went to uh, uh, an association. I said, if uh, I produce this book and I put on it that you guys you know, were involved with it, uh, would you buy enough for your members? And they said, yes. And so then I went to a, a magazine publisher and I said, if I uh, give you the pages camera ready, uh, ready to go to the printer, um, and you can sell advertising, this is a unique idea, you can have ads and put them in the back and you can keep all the income from the ads, and I guarantee you that you'll have this many sales for this association, would you then print the book and give me 500 copies? Well, they did the arithmetic and they said, sure. So I wound up with 500 copies. So that was my first book mm -hmm. as such. I learned a lot. There's a page in there where I had done with a magic marker sort of an outline of a keyboard saying to the printer, this is where the picture goes. And the picture never made it in there. So you have this wonderful little Can't drawing, drawing there. An original Romano. That's right. This could be very valuable someday, like Picasso's early work. So uh, after that, what I did was um, I was writing for a variety of magazines. I didn't start my own at that point. And so what I did was every article I wrote was essentially going to be a chapter in a book. Mm -hmm. And I planned it out that in one year, with all the magazines I was writing for, I could do that. And so when it was done, I took it all. I had to have it retypeset, because in those days you couldn't repurpose anything. And I uh, had it printed hardcover and uh, went to sell it at this trade show. And um, one of the magazines, the one I wrote the most for, took all the articles and put it into a little saddle stitch version. and were giving it away, and I was charging $9. Uh -huh. So I learned an important lesson there uh, of not competing with yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure you have the rights to your own material. So uh, since then, we've done 16 books um, through various publishers. Some have been, have been self-published, and uh, some have gone through big publishers. I've now worked with just about everybody you can imagine and have learned all the, the, the problems associated with the book publishing industry. And well, of course, as we know it, it's, it's, it's a trade industry, but as most people know it, it's a consumer industry. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the, 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 uh, the way the work gets done and, and, and in book publishing. The publisher starts out with, you know, where's the idea come from for a book usually? Okay, it never comes from the publisher. Very infrequent. Every now and then a publisher might do an immediate book because there's some hot topic out there, the death of Diana, so they want to get a book on the street as quickly as possible. That's usually not the case. The way the book industry traditionally works is that uh, an author has an idea, and now the idea is to sell the publisher on it. Now, that's an almost impossible task. My son worked for a major publisher for a number of years after he graduated from college, and um, he said if you sent them an unsolicited manuscript, the odds are, he, he said it goes into what they call the slough pile. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, sometimes he, every now and then he'd go through it and it'd be a great thing, but they would never be considered only those that come in from agents are, okay. are considered. So if you're going to write your next mystery novel, find an agent. That's the most important thing. The agent then, and this is for most of your consumer titles, the agent is the one that finds the publisher, pitches it to an editor, and the editor then gets approval and buys the rights. Now, would an author, does an author uh, pay, pay the agent to do that? The agent gets a percentage of whatever the deal turns out to be. Now, in the trade book area, com com computer books and others, that usually is direct. Usually the, there, the publishers try to identify the movers and shakers, the people in an industry, and they go to them and ask them to write books. But there are a few agents. In fact, one book that I published uh, many years ago went through uh, an agent who only handled computer books. Uh, so usually it's the agent that you have to go through, unless it's a trade book of some sort. And then you might find a publisher that only deals in that, that subject. Uh, the next thing that happens is a contract. Normally they send you a contract. Mm, the yeah. author. As an author. Mm -hmm. It's quite thick. Lots of legal mumbo-jumbo in it. And what it says is that you have just given them all the rights.
forever. Mm -hmm. um, usually, unless you're Stephen King, who just left his publisher and has thrown it out on the street to be negotiated, and uh, one large publishing company is actually forming a whole new division just to publish Stephen King mm -hmm. materials, if you don't have that kind of clout, you're going to accept whatever this contract says. So you give them all rights um, in return for a percentage. That perc percentage is between 8% and 15% of the net income of the book. Now, when the book is produced, it normally gets sold through channels. The most common channel are bookstores. Okay. So the books then are printed. They go to warehouses. Many of the book printers have warehouses, or those warehouses are affiliated with the major wholesalers, like Ingram. Ingram is the biggest of all. Uh, they then wind up at bookstores. The bookstore gets the book at 40% off the list price. Normally, the book is printed. The price is printed on the book. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, a marketplace where you can raise the price a, at all. So the bookseller is getting a fixed 40%. Now, they can get better than that if they buy 100 of one title. They can buy 100 of mixed titles and get 42%. Sometimes there'll be a deal they can get 50%. So, so just, to, just to give an example, a book that has a $10 uh, price printed on it, the bookseller would buy that for uh, $6. That's correct. And, and okay. So they're making four bucks. Now the problem now is that you have these book superstores that are discounting uh, many of the books by 30%. Now if the bookseller does, the small bookseller does that, they only make 10% on the book. Mm -hmm. So they can't afford to compete. So that's why the big superstores are taking over. Or you could buy books at Sam's Club and places like that where the book is discounted 50% mm -hmm. because they're buying thousands of them at one time. So they could be getting a 60% discount. Uh, which allows them to do that, and virtually destroying the independent bookseller mm -hmm. as, as a channel at the present time. What type of, uh, of uh, money changes hands between the publisher and these large uh, bookstores? Uh, I, if I walk into, into Barnes & Noble, for example, and I see a book right there on the, on, you know, on the front table, uh, that position has got to be worth a lot of money. Uh, I learned a lot about that, by the way, from the magazine business. When, um, when I sold the magazine, I wanted it to go and be sold through newsstands. That's why, that's why there's a barcode on them. And one of the major sales channels for magazines is bookstores. And what I discovered is they have racks of magazines. Your position in the rack is determined by how much you pay them. Mm. Uh, so if you want it to be on the top where you see most of the magazine, it's not covered over, uh, you're going to pay a, a certain amount of money for that position. By the way, the same is true of books. Some publishers actually buy the shelf space so that they have a place to put their books so they get visibility because most bookstores cannot have every book that's out there so you're limited by by how many eyes can see it so if you buy the space you know that their eyes going to see your book and so that's a, that in all those cases people are paying a premium for the visibility right now i i go into these uh new superstores and um and they have couches and, and chairs, and I, and I take a book off the shelf, and I'll sit there, and I can read the whole book if I want, and then put it back. Uh, how, how can that happen? Uh, what, who's paying for me being able to read the book in the store like well, that? Well, the assumption is that most people aren't going to spend all the day doing that. Two, there aren't that many chairs and couches. And three, you're <laughs> probably going to do it over at the Java bar, where they're going to make more money on the overpriced muffins and coffee uh -huh. than they make on the books. Right. Okay. So that, there's there's something going on there. Uh, what a, what about the books that don't sell though? I mean, what if a, what if uh, I I heard a figure for a book that recently Jay uh, Leno, uh, leading with my chin, um, the the number of of uh, they printed a million of those books and and only sold 150,000 um, and. Where does that 800, where does that okay. 850,000 unsold books, where do they go? Okay, two different models. If it's a paperback book, a mass market paperback, this is an oversight, so it's a trade paperback, if you will. Uh, what happens is the, the uh, uh, bookstore, by the way, every bookstore has the right within a period of three months to send every book back for credit. So three they, months? Three months. So on paperbacks, th they don't want to incur the cost. And besides, they get banged up. Mm -hmm. So you rip the covers off and you send the covers back. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to throw away the paperback book. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll be traveling in some remote part of the United States and you'll come to some dusty uh, stand and somebody selling paperback books without covers I on them. I remember that uh, uh, many years illegal. ago. Illegal. Um, 
So on paperbacks, they are just thrown away at the bookstore level. Um, I don't think there's anybody who takes them back and, and reclaims them in any way. On the hardcover size, they are sent back to credit, and the physical book is sent back. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens then is they're left over, and they are called remainders. They didn't sell. By the way, I bought one of those Jay Leno books, if you must. <laughs> Have I even bought the... Was uh, it a good book? Yeah, I got, and bought the audio tape, too, by the way. Uh, so, um, in any case, on the hardcovers, they come back, they're remaindered, they're in a warehouse, and there are companies out there who buy them by the pound. So they'll go in and buy all the remainders uh, for 10 cents a pound. Now, all those books wind up in very strange bookstores, and you've seen them, but you didn't know what they were all about. These are bookstores that are not... They don't have names that you've ever heard of. They just say bookstore, or they say books. Mm -hmm. and you go in there, and you go to the computer section, and there they have a book on Microsoft Word 2.0. Uh -huh. And you say, wait, this is a little bit behind the time, isn't it? Well, these stores only sell remainders. Mm -hmm. They might have a few bestsellers out front to drag you in, but most of them are books that just never sold. Mm -hmm. And so they stay in that store for some period of time, and if they don't sell there, then they go to the landfill. That's the end of them at that point. They are not donated to libraries or anything like that. So books, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Jay, listening to, you listened to Jay Leno in your car. Uh, yeah. the, was he actually reading? He read that? it. It was great. So, so, and so he did all the voices the way, if you read the book, you would have never gotten it. Uh-huh. So, so uh, a lot of the, these bestseller type books, the, they come in an, an electronic form now, too. What's, what's happening there? Is that, is that taking business away from the printed book, or is it, is it, are they books that would never sell in print form? No, no, actually, um, I listen to lots of them because I drive a lot. Um, over the summer, uh, I was listening to Meg, uh, which is a, a, became a bestseller. It's about this giant shark from prehistoric times. <laughs> it was a very exciting book, and listening to it, if you get a good reader who changes voice and adds inflection, it's just wonderful. Uh, I listened to the uh, uh, autobiography of the uh, publisher of the uh, Washington Post, and uh, she narrated it herself. And when she got to the section where her husband uh, committed suicide, it was very emotional to, to hear that person talk about it. I think it's because people like us travel. Mm -hmm. And when you travel, that's a great way to, to do it. The other reason is people who are blind listen to these kinds of books as well. It's not a gigantic profit area, by the way, but it does, it does pretty well for some publishers. Not, by the way, not every book makes it to an audio. Right. So the entire cost of the, the, the whole business is based on the sale of the final product. There is no advertising in there. Uh, so, the, so whatever I pay for that book, the, it has to pay for the printing, and the, it's, that's, that's it. The publishers, that's exactly right. The publishers have an interesting model, and I think it, it is Byzantine in its complexity. It's, it's a push publishing model, and it says in effect, I'm going to produce some number of these, and I'm going to push them in the market, and I hope it sells a lot. Now, there are 51,000 new titles that are published every year. The average in, in, run in the U.S.? In the United States alone. 51,000 new titles? New titles. Um, by the way, that's less than Germany, and that's less than Great Britain. Really? And I think that's because those two countries don't have a lot of channels of cable. Mm -hmm. So TV, I think, takes a lot of our time away mm -hmm. from reading. So we push these books out into the marketplace. Now, what happens is the publisher is looking for one thing. They're looking for a blockbuster. They're looking for the next Tom Clancy, Danielle Steele, Harold Robbins, someone who's going to sell a million books. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the genre, the biggest one is romance novels. Mm -hmm. Then you have mystery. Um, and then it gets into other mass market mm -hmm. uh, titles, most, mostly fiction, some nonfiction. And the publishers every year push out tons of titles. And the average run is about 4,000. Average run for, for, for across the, first, the whole Across industry. the whole spectrum of books. Okay. So 4,000 get produced. They, they go to bookstores who buy one of them, or they go to reviewers. And the publisher is hoping that it will catch on. And if it catches on, they go to the second printing, and they start to see what the sales were and the demand was, and they might up it or lower it, mm -hmm. because the, the last printing will kill you mm -hmm. on a book, because you don't want to have a whole batch of them in the warehouse. Right. You can avoid it. Right. And so shorter and shorter runs, that's the goal until the point where we really want to publish on demand. Now, the way they're solving, saving a lot of money now is the publishers now, for most books, send out a preprint. What they do is they take the book, uh, put it on a DocuTech um, or some other digital printer, but mm -hmm. DocuTech is very common, print it, uh, tape bind it, and send it to the bookstores and reviewers in advance. It's a cheaper book to produce, 
they read it and hopefully recommend it, and then they come out with the, uh, the professional version. Now, some of them will click and start to sell. Mm -hmm. And if you get a few bestsellers, it makes the publishing house. Mm -hmm. You only need one author, and that one author can make you. Clancy makes his publishing house. King made his publishing house. Uh, they all, and they can demand then whatever mm -hmm. they want. King is now demanding $6 million for his next, uh, it's actually a combination of wow. three books. Um, Tom Clancy, I think it was a $3 million deal on, on two books uh, that he was doing. Um, so if they can get that, then that's where the money is. But most of them don't get that. Mm -hmm. And so many of them get remaindered books and they have a problem. Now, if you're in the trade area, you could probably sell that book over some period of time unless it has a technology that's dated, like mm -hmm. this one, book on on-demand printing. The first one we did, by the way, uh, we had to update it. Now it's twice as thick. Right. Uh, and that's only, what, about a year between the a first year and between second the two. edition. Now, this is a very interesting story because it has to do with technology and publishing. Every publisher would love to do on demand. In other words, I only produce the number I absolutely need, and then as I need more, I get them as I need them. Mm -hmm. So this was a book on on-demand printing, so we did it on demand. And we did it on a docutech, and we used the channel bind. Uh, so it, it, it looks like a book, and it smells like a book, and actually, you know, the, the quality of it is a book. Right. Um, biggest mistake we ever made, because we sold several thousand of these. And the cost per copy was phenomenally high. Right. Uh, what we did with the second printing was we printed them. We uh -huh. went to a printer who printed them on a big printing press with lots of pages on a signature, professionally bound them, and the cost per unit was about 12% of what this one was. Wow. Uh, now, the reason was that we kind of knew how many we would sell at this right, point. Right. Now, what happens when we sell the, the last copy of this one? We'll do it on demand. Mm -hmm. See, that's where they really should work together is the ability to do the quantity you want on the most cost-effective system and then go to on-demand as you need it later on. So we learned a, a great lesson in doing that. So that will be a major chapter in the next version. So that, that point at which you decide to, to, to go from the, the mass run uh, con using conventional printing to the, to the printing on-demand, I mean, there's a point where the demand falls below a certain threshold and you're going to make that decision. Um, can you imagine at some point walking into a bookstore and, and having a book printed in the bookstore? In fact, that's what I've been predicting for the last five years. And only now, the complete infrastructure is now in place to do that. Um, what, the, the things that were needed. First of all, it had nothing to do with the production. That was not a major problem. The biggest problem was the intellectual property. Um, how do you get the intellectual property, the, the, the content of the book, um, and make sure that everybody gets paid for it. Because mm -hmm. the publishers have a model now where the bookstores pay the wholesaler, the wholesaler pays the publisher. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing that made that possible was the Copyright Clearance Center in Topsfield, Massachusetts. You can go to them and get the rights to print any book uh, in any quantity. Um, so if you wanted to do a chapter from this book and a chapter from this book, you can actually put it together. They will tell you the rate, which by the way is relatively low. Mm -hmm. And so you pay them, they then, for every book you do, they then pay the publishers. And so the intellectual property is protected. That was the first problem. Second problem was, where are these files? First of all, we needed to have them in a form that we could use. Well, PDF solves that problem altogether. So I have a PDF file, but each publisher wants to maintain their own database. They don't want to give their files to some, someone else. Mm -hmm. So what's happening then is the Copyright Clearance Center or some other organization will act as the clearinghouse or the gatekeeper. And so when I then want to print this book out, I will contact the Copyright Clearance Center um, because I have an account with them and tell them what I want. They will then find the database, uh, get the release the file from the database, and send it to me so that I can print it out on my high-speed printer. Third problem, how do you know that when I get that file, I don't produce more than the one that I've contracted to get? The Association for American Publishers has just come up with a coding system, so carried along with that file is a lot of information, including information on the print run, mm -hmm. so that chips that could be built into the systems that drive the printers will know how many can be printed out with that particular file. Um, last problem, production. Digital printers can do this now. Because of the fact that they have variable data capability, they can put a, a document together in order, and the last step in the process, we're starting to finally find systems that can do uh, small runs of books with uh, hardcover binding. With a hardcover binding. And so all the pieces are now in place. So I would predict uh, that you will see, uh, as a first step, uh, you'll see the wholesalers. Ingram, 
has just signed up with IBM to buy IBM's highest speed uh, printing system. It's 1,000 pages a minute at 600 DPI. Ingram's concept is that they will maintain a database of books that go out of print, mm -hmm. and that as people, as they are ordered by the bookstores, they will be manufactured by Ingram and then shipped to the bookstore with the order for that bookstore. The next step is to put it into the superstores, like Barnes and Noble or Borders, and they will then print it there for you. I see. Well, Frank, we're, uh, we're about out of time for this program. I think uh, this has been a great lesson in publishing, and we've seen uh, uh, the one model where we had advertising uh, uh, driving the whole thing, and, and then these other models where, uh, where it's, it's, it's a different, uh, different kind of business. Um, I really appreciate your coming here, and um, we'll hope to talk to you again sometime. Yeah, let me tell everybody, by the way, it's very easy to get into publishing, very little capital investment to start a magazine, uh, or a book. So if you want to make a fortune, there's a way to do it. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you, Frank.